half of it is going to be classical stuff, and half it would be a discussion about quantum, quantum gravity uh, things, issues. Uh, where I hope we will be able to apply some of the things that we have discussed at the classical level to get some hints about what um, what would be needed to, to be done to, to make progress on some of the key questions or some of the important questions in, in quantum, some of what seem to be important questions in quantum gravity. So last time we, we ended up we ended uh, with the, a very brute force derivation of the first law, in which we simply used the fact that the uh, no hair theorem implied that uh, uh, on the, that uh, Ken Newman black hole is the unique stationary electrovacuum black hole. And just by taking, uh, for example, the mass function as expressed as in terms of the area, the angular momentum, and the charge, and differentiating this function, we could derive the first law with the idea that when you perturb a stationary black hole, you can wait long enough until you reach a new, physically spe speaking, a new equilibrium state. And so the initial and the final state will be described by this state function, the mass as a function of the area, angular momentum in charge. And so if you want to talk about infinitesimal changes, then differentiating this function tells you everything about the the system. Of course, the hypothesis is that the Nocher theorem holds and that you don't destroy the black hole by throwing a, a chair or some perturbation. Okay, today we're going to do a very simple derivation that can be, that was, uh, I think, is originally in papers by uh, Hawking and Carter Hawking and collaborators, uh, but it can be also found in the the small book on quantum field theory and curved space times by Wall. I like it very much because it uh, it gives us a physical intuition behind this law, and so this is called the physical process proof of the first law of black holes, yeah, of course. So what we have in mind is the picture of a general black hole space-time that, as we argued in this course, should look like this, or is expected to look like this, <clears throat> you know, um, a space-like singularity. This black hole has formed from gravi gravitational collapse of some matter, which is this red thing here. And now uh, we want to imagine, so well, we have the usual structure of an asymptotically flat space-time, cry plus, cry minus, I naught, and so on. Now, I'm not gonna work. I mean, one could make all these things precise by going to infinity, but for the proof that we have in mind, it suffice to think of, remember some, some observers or family of observers. So this is the world tube of observers outside the black hole, sufficiently far away. They will move along a time-like world tube that if I take it sufficiently far away, it will just degenerate into this, uh, into infinity, right? Into this null surfaces. But for drawing the pictures, it's better to think of this uh, at some finite distance, but think of it as being very, very far away, sufficiently far away. So this blue wall tube is in the region where the space-time is very well approximated by Minkowski space-time and where uh, the killing, the station, I mean, the space-time is supposed to become stationary in this region sufficient for sufficiently late times and the stationarity killing field is in this blue region, it's just the inertial time translations, d by dt. Remember in Schwarzschild or in Kerr, uh, d by dt in adapted coordinates has norm one as we go to, to infinity. So I'm gonna call this w infinity, maybe I shouldn't have, I shouldn't have put it there. So this, this is the world tube W infinity is this uh, hypersurface, time-like hypersurface there. 
Another hypersurface that will play an important role in our discussion is the horizon, which I'm going to call simply H. So there are two hypersurfaces that are important, these observers far away and H. And now we think of perturbing the black hole by sending some matter in. So this matter can come from time like infinity. And so something falls in here. So this is the matter comes from time like infinity. I could have sent it from scry minus. It doesn't make any much of a difference. If you send something from scry minus, then you have to accelerate it to, to get out of scry minus, or it has to be some null matter. So I prefer something like that. So this is a little small planet that was outside the black hole and then one day fell into the black hole. So this uh, is the perturbation that it that appears in the first law, right? We have a stationary black hole and we perturb it. We're gonna describe this matter by delta TAB. So there will be an energy momentum tensor that delta means it's small. And we're gonna use linearized gravity to describe what happens with the horizon. Okay, so we're gonna introduce some currents. We're gonna call JM the matter, the mass current is defined as minus delta TAB contracted with Xi B. Again, Xi B is uh, the killing field, the stationarity killing field. We are assuming that in the region of interest, things become stationary, right? That's the content of the first law. We are perturbing something that is initially stationary and we're gonna wait until it becomes stationary again. So this is the killing field by dt the one that is time-like outside. And we're gonna consider also the current J, J, if you want, the angular momentum current, which is just the very same, very similar thing, but instead contracted with the other Keeling field, the Keeling field of axis symmetry which is also a symmetry that we assume to be present in this final state, which according to the Noher theorem is given by the Kerr-Newman solution. Now, the uh, gravitational equations imply that, so the Bianchi identities or the, you know, Einstein's equations imply that uh, the perturbation, we are perturbing a care black hole. In fact, all this works easily for a Kerr black hole. So this is a vacuum solution of Einstein's equations. If you have a Kerr Newman black hole, then there is a background electric uh, electromagnetic field and the proof is a little bit more involved. Uh, there is a paper by Wall where, where they generalize it to the Kerr Newman case. I'm not going to do that because uh, it's easier. It's much simpler to just do Kerr. Um, <clears throat> Precisely, this equation doesn't hold in, 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 in the case of Kerr Newman because there is background matter. Here it holds because all the matter that is around is this perturbation. Before, there is only vacuum, there are no electromagnetic fields. So, because this equation holds, then in just two lines and using the Leibniz rule, and I realize I made a mistake here, the angular momentum current doesn't have a minus sign. Okay. The minus sign here is to take into account that uh, the uh, killing vector Xi is time like So there is no minus sign there, and that's important. Okay, these two currents are conserved because of this equation and because of the killing equation that is satisfied by these two, two, two guys in particular. For example, grad A, Xi B, symmetrized equals zero, and sim similarly for Xi. I don't need to write it, but because of these two equations, then in one line, you prove that um, grad A of J M, A is equal to zero, so that the mass current is conserved and that the uh, angular momentum current is also conserved. Okay, and that's gonna be important in what follows. And of course, I mean, from this picture, you see that the flow of these currents here will be the same as here because of uh, Gauss law. The conservation implies that the flow through, I mean, how much, mat how much of J crosses the blue hypersurface for these observers 
will be equal to how much it crosses the horizon, okay? Because of, of the Gauss law. And this is gonna play a key role in what follows. Now, in order to actually prove this first law along this, these ideas, we need, to, <clears throat> we need to do the following assumption, which is a very reasonable physical assumption. Let me see how do I, uh, yeah, I will copy this one. So in fact, in fact, uh, we, we will replace, let me see if I can do it here. We will replace all this. I think I will be able to do it, a bit of patience. We're gonna replace the diagram we had by the following one. Huh? No, it's not so easy to <laughs> wait. Hold on. Okay, I should have started. I mean, it's nice if I can do it, but I'm, I, I think I know how to do it now. Since I didn't practice how to do this, it will be this. We're going to replace the um, uh, Penrose diagram of this collapsing black hole by the maximal extension that is assumed to contain to have a bifurcating horizon. So the, what is the idea? The idea is that beyond some you know, region, outside region here, this space time here is simply isomorphic to this one, okay? So there is some, some some region here where that can be mapped isomorphically to the other one. This assumption, if you think about it, makes sense. And it has to do with this physical intuition that the space time uh, you know, settles down to a stationary uh, situation and the stationary situation contains a bifurcating horizon. Yeah, you might say, okay, no, but uh, if we talk about the bifurcating horizon and if we talk about the situation where there is spin, then the inside is not quite that, but we are not gonna need anything about the inside. So if you want, I can just forget about the singularity being space-like. And so the inside is whatever it needs to be, but all our manipulations will happen outside, okay? So the reason is that um, with this, uh, in this way, we will be able to, to use the geometric structure of what happens here at this point. And this is what is going to simplify the proof. But physically, remember, everything we're calculating is happening in a region where this diagram and the previous one are isomorphic. So the space time is the same in this one and in the previous one, as far as we are in, the, in this future region. But the existence of the bifurcating horizon will be important. Okay, so uh, I could have said that later. Uh, um, Anyhow, but it is said, I want to write something and I don't have space. So let me just erase some part of this diagram that is not really very important for this. So I get, I gain space and I write that, you know, if you look at the, the Gauss law implies that, well, well, we're gonna talk about the Gauss law, but if I consider the integral So associated to, to this delta TAB, observers, which are here far away at W infinity, will say that they are sending a certain amount of mass into the black hole. And this mass is just given by the integral in W of JM. And this happens to be the same thing because of Gauss law, because these currents are conserved as the integral of the same current on the horizon. So the first equality is what tells me that this can be called a mass because this is the amount of mass actually as measured by the, the, the observer at infinity. Why, 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 why? That's very important. Because at W infinity, this guy, this killing field is uh, the time translation 
is the is the inertial time for observers sufficiently far away and so if you just write this integral here you're just computing the mass you're putting into the system so the first equality is just what what gives you, gives you the right to call this mass just because this guy is just inertial time translation at w infinity of course i am assuming that this blue thing is sufficiently far away and the second inequality is just the Gauss law. And similarly, I can write that the amount of angular momentum put into the system is given by, by definition, the integral W infinity of JJ. So the flux of JJ, which because of the conservation of JJ as well, is equal to the integral on the horizon of J. All right, so these are uh, important equations. So now, um, more precisely, okay, no, not more precisely. Let me now say the following thing. It's not more precise, it's just the same thing, but uh, complementary to that. Um, the first law will emerge from, so let me just uh, zoom. So let me, let me just take a little piece, I'm gonna, draw it in yellow ah, to, to. let me take a space-time region that looks like no, not like this like this time like here space like here null here and i'm going to apply the gauss law there we are already doing it here but uh, i'm going to concentrate on that thing and I want to write a new diagram that has that. So that diagram has a null component. This is the horizon, a space-like component, another space-like component and the time component. So <clears throat> this is a piece of the horizon and this is a piece of W infinity. And then, um, so let me call this W infinity by abuse. So it's just a piece of it. This is H, this is Sigma one, and this is Sigma two. But of course, okay, so it would be hard to actually, I mean, it's too, too sorry, but huh, this should be bigger. Anyhow, uh, it's hard to draw the matter here without violating the intuitive causality, which is that things are at 45 degrees. I'm sorry, this should be bigger, but it doesn't matter. I hope uh, that doesn't, introduce any confusion. Um, now we're going to apply the Gauss law. And so you have normals, which conventionally have to point like this. This is, uh, you know, and the normal. And, uh, and there are normals here, but the matter only crosses. And this is where my, okay, allow me to violate. <laughs> okay, I hope you understand. This is wrong, but I don't want to draw the picture again. So this is the matter. Okay, this seems to be faster than light, according to. So, just do the right diagram yourself, so that I don't have to do it again. But this, basically, all the flux of matter. If you look at the previous, uh, the flux, the non-trivial flux happens on the portion of W infinity and a portion of the null um, horizon. In fact, I realized that we're going to need to extend this region all the way to here. So let me draw it again for reasons that will become clear in a moment. So the region I am interested in has to go all the way to the bifurcating point because the bifurcating horizon, the bifurcating point will be crucial in actually simplifying this proof. So, so this is kind of the the region, which looks like this here. And so here, I, this point here is the bifurcating point. All right, so the Gauss law implies that uh, for any conserved current, the flux along W infinity is equal to the flux along the horizon. That's what we said before. 
But I'm going to consider another killing field and another conserved quantity, conserved current. And this is J psi A, which is simply given by delta T A B contracted with the, 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 the combination of killing fields that becomes the generator of the horizon at the horizon. So this is psi B plus omega um, psi B. Of course, this is also a killing field because it's a linear combination with constants of killing fields. So this current is also conserved. And so it follows that the flux of this current along the horizon, along the horizon plus the flux at infinity or at W infinity is equal to zero. And we'll see in a moment that this is nothing else but the first law. So let's first compute F at infinity. And so F W infinity is just the integral at W infinity of J A of J chi, but this is nothing else but the integral of J M plus because of this, the, the integral of minus J M Remember the minus sign that went into the definition of JM plus omega JJ. So from here at W infinity and from the previous discussion, this is nothing else but delta M minus delta M plus omega delta J. And so you start seeing the kind of things that appear in the first law. So the only thing that is that remains to be calculated is F at the horizon the flux of this current at the horizon. And that's what we're going to do next. So F at the horizon is given by the integral. And here we have to be explicit at the horizon of J chi. But this is nothing else but the integral at the horizon of delta TAB perturbation contracted with psi B. That's what the current J psi was times the normal NA at the horizon, which is going to be the null normal. So uh, the Gauss law for null surfaces has some subtleties that I don't have to go time to go th through, but the null, the norm here, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a standard thing in the differential geometry and you can read it in any book. So now surfaces are special as far as, uh, as the Gauss law is concerned, but you can I mean one, the normal, I mean, there are many possible normals to a null surface and the Gauss, the flux uh, that goes to the Gauss law naturally is the flux computed with some affine, param uh, some affine normal. So this normal has to be given by, so this normal is gonna be I'm going to call it at the horizon, the normal at the horizon is going to be something I will call Ka. Uh, why K? Because K is a natural name for something that is null. Of course, it has to be null. And, uh, and it will be geodesic. So the integral is well defined, uh, or it's easier to express the fluxes when you use some null normal that, in addition, is a finely parameterized. It's a geodesic that is a finely parameterized. So I am assuming that all these two equations hold for this NA. So here we have integral over H delta TAB psi B uh, KB KB. And I will be more explicit now in a moment because I need to say more, some more things. What is the measure of integration here? What are we doing? What kind of integral are we doing? So if you are, in this uh, setup, and if you, so your vector field is geodesic, then it means that you can add, write your vector field as d by d, some affine parameter that I'm going to call it, I'm going to call V, capital V. This is by analogy with the 
cruise coordinate, in fact, V, capital V is in a fine parameter along the horizon and D by DV is null. So this is just in a fine parameter adapted to this null geodesics. Of course, this, these are a finely parameterized geodesics, but we know that there is another, another null normal, which is geodesic at a bifurcating horizon at the horizon of a current black hole. And this is um, given by uh, the vector field chi itself. So we know that chi must be proportional to, to k because, uh, because chi is geodesic. Remember that chi a grad a chi b satisfies the equation that defines the surface gravity. So by sticking this into this equation, right, we get alpha k a grad a of alpha k b. And now we use the Leibniz rule. We see that the k k term goes away because we are assuming that uh, k is geodesic. And so this equation gives me simply alpha k a grad a of alpha, the whole thing times k b equals kappa times psi, which is alpha chi b. And so we see that this is solved by this being equal to kappa. So in other words, and this is nothing else but d alpha by the v capital v equal kappa and one possible solution i am only interested in one solution and what i'm going to do is independent of what you choose as a solution is that alpha is just kappa which is a constant remember because of the zeroth law times v so what we just showed is that chi a is given by kappa v times ka. And that was something that was discussed before, or there was a question in the previous uh, lecture. We evoked this. And uh, now it's going to be of crucial importance. So now we come back to this point. In fact, let me do this. Let me copy this one. And so I'm going to continue from here, from where we were. erase all that that remained in the previous page. So with what we just wrote and uh, we see that this term here can be written as the integral of delta T A B K B sorry, K A, K B times Kappa V. I just rewrote the integral here. And now I am, I am capable of writing the integration measure because the theory of the, I mean, the Gauss law differential geometry tells you that when you have adapted your normal to a, a fine uh, geodesic, then the, 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 the volume integral is given, the volume form is just given by integral in terms of the affine parameter times integral in the two sphere transfers to the geodesics. So that's the right measure. And you can quickly check, check that if you were to change your affine parameterization, this is all uh, invariant, basically. It's in, in, invariant and reparameterization of, of your normals, as long as you remain on a affinely parameterized geodesic. Okay, so that's the thing we want to calculate. And I have to make a little detour at this point and remind you of something of a great um, geometric importance. This is the Ray Chaduri equation because we will be able to relate this quantity here to the focusing properties of uh, the matter that is crossing the horizon. So the matter crossing the horizon will focus the generators of the the generators of the horizon changing the area here. So this term that we're finding here will be finally, we already found that a piece of, the, of this uh, equation here contains delta M and delta J. The other piece, the missing piece will contain the change in the area, which is what goes into the first law. And the reason is the Ray-Chadur equation. What is the Ray-Chadur equation? The Ray-Chadur equation controls 
the focusing of generators when matter goes through. So we have a horizon like that and we are sending some matter, you know, through the horizon. And so this will actually produce focusing in, of the generators and change the, the, the way in which the area or the, and the geometry more generally of the horizon changes. But in particular, as far as the area is concerned, there is this, uh, this very simple equation that controls the behavior of the expansion of uh, this null geodesics. And this is called the Ray Chadur equation. Which tells me that as when you're giving an affine parameter, and here I'm going to use V, the way in which theta changes along the generators is given in general by the following expression minus one half of theta square minus a term that has to do with the square that, that is given by the square of the shear of the geodesic congruence, the geodesic congruence that defines the generators of the horizon minus RAB contracted, so the Ricci tensor contracted with Ka, Kb. Now, what we are doing here is we are sending, you know, throwing a chair, so perturbing the horizon of, a, of an otherwise stationary black hole. So we know that before sending this chair in, theta is just equal to zero. Not, not only that, so because the horizon is not expanding, right? This is a stationary black hole horizon. Its area is not changing along the generators. Another thing we know is that sigma AB is also equal to zero. In fact, here there could be another term that contains the so-called twist, but that does not appear here because our, um, our congruence is normal to the horizon and therefore uh, is surface forming and therefore the twist term goes away. So, but initially because of stationarity, because we are in an equilibrium state, both sigma and theta are equal to zero, and now we're sending a small amount of matter, delta TAB. So in the sense of perturbation theory, these terms are zero to linear order in perturbation theory because they are both quadratic, right? And to zero order, are, these quantities are zero. So if we consider perturbation theory, linearized gravity, then the equation becomes, so I could put it approximately equal to so I'm going to be formal. So the, uh, you see what I mean? So these two terms are not there. We just get minus RAB, KA, KB, plus order delta T square, I would say, if you, if you see. I mean, this is the formal part. So up to nonlinear correction. So in, in the sense of linearized gravity, we get this very simple form of uh, the Ray Chadwick equation that tells me that the way in which theta, the expansion of the null congruence evolves in, uh, with V has to do with these components of the energy moment of the um, Ricci tensor, which via Einstein's equations are given by eight pi delta TAB, Ka, Kb, which is exactly the thing that enters into our expression of the flux here. So we see that we can rewrite this term as follows. From the Ray Chadur equation, which tells me that this is equal to minus eight pi delta TAB KA KB. We have that FH, the thing we're trying to compute is given by minus kappa, I can take it out. over eight pi, this is this eight pi here, the minus sign is this minus sign here, the integral of d theta times dv 
times P dV dS squared. Okay, I just used the right other equation and now we're almost done. You can integrate this by parts and you can write this as kappa over eight pi. I integrate by parts and this, this becomes the integral of theta a minus sign dV dS square minus kappa over eight pi, the boundary, the, the total derivative, which becomes the integral of theta times V dS square evaluated in the boundaries of integration. I'm integrating V here between V equals zero and infinity. V equals zero, why do I say V equals zero? Again, think of, I am infinity. What I am uh, assuming is that I am setting the origin. I am setting, uh, in fact, I mean, I should have said that before. Remember that this point is special. What, in what sense it is special? Here, the bifurcating, the generator of the horizon equals zero. At the bifurcating point, the killing field that generates the horizon vanishes. And this is exactly what we have chosen here. Um, and I forgot to mention it. Rem you see, chi is given by kappa v times k. So v equals zero is the point, v equals zero is the point b, the bifurcating point. So we take, so this term is just zero. Why? It is zero at this endpoint because v is equal to zero and it's zero at infinity because we're assuming that theta must go, that, go back to zero if the black hole is, I mean, if, if the, physically, if the black hole is to become stationary at the end of this process. So we are throwing some matter in, but then at that point there, the black hole is stationary again or asymptotically in this direction. So theta has to vanish asymptotically there. And for that reason, this other term is also lost. And so this boundary term that we have here just drops out and we only get this one. I'm gonna copy this page and we are done basically because um, you see, let me erase a few things. So we don't need the right other equation. We have used it already. This term is zero. Don't worry, I mean, the, the previous page is, is there. So, but this by definition of what the expansion means, this quantity here is delta of the area. Is the change of the area of the horizon. Remember that theta is given by, it, it represents the way in which uh, the area is changing in, in um, a fine time V. So we're integrating in S2. This is given us how this is basically area dot uh, integrated in V that gives us delta A. So we're done because if we go back to the previous, ah, to the previous page, remember that we can rewrite this quantity here, basically that this plus, so what we get is, Um, by sticking this into the equation FH plus F W infinity equals zero coming from the Gauss law, we find that delta area times kappa over eight pi minus delta mass plus omega delta J equals zero, which is exactly the first law of black hole mechanics. And this completes, completes the proof of the first law the physical process version of the first, of the proof. As I said, if the black hole is charged, then things are a little bit more complicated, but uh, a proof exists. So just a, a quick corollary of all this.
there is a local version. Which is interesting. So what do I mean? So if this is um, just by looking at the proof which is made, so you see, you should see immediately that if we consider instead of this um, W infinity, these observers at infinity, we can consider observers that are very close by the horizon at some fixed distance L, space-like distance. So let me call them W not. So what are these observers? These are stationary observers. And these are the stationary observers that we introduced before because the killing field chi, which becomes null at the horizon. So the generators of the horizon at the horizon this is time like right outside the horizon. So we can define these local observers, which we represented as people sitting on a table on the horizon or on, on some starship, right? That remain close to the horizon and they don't see anything changing around them. They are following the orbits of killing fields. Now, uh, you know, you can just repeat the same calculation we had before. I mean, using Gauss's law, you find that the integral on H of J chi must be also equal to the integral of J chi on W zero. And now, so we just show that this, this side becomes delta area times kappa over, over A pi. This is this part, but what is this part? So this just uh, this is just the integral on W naught of delta T A B chi A and B. But chi is just uh, the norm. So this can be written as the integral of the norm of chi times delta T A B, the norm square, U, A, and B. And it turns out that the norm of this uh, killing field close to the horizon is independent of theta and phi. It's independent of, uh, it's, it's actually becomes a constant. And so you can pull it out of, the, of this integral. So what you find is that kappa divided by eight pi chi chi, the norm of chi, delta area equals to the integral of delta T A B U A and B. But this is what these local observers will call how much energy has flown into the system. So this is delta E according to these local ob ob um, observers. And it turns out that if you're sufficiently close, this quantity kappa divided by chi chi it's just a constant. It becomes one over the distance to the horizon. And so you get this local first law that tells you that uh, one over eight pi L, the change in the area is directly related to the change in the energy measured by these people that are close to the horizon. So the first law that contains work terms and is more complicated as seen from infinity in terms of delta M and delta J becomes simply an equivalence an equivalence between the local energy and the chain and area of the horizon. Of course, the equivalence cannot be mass makes uh, this uh, scale intervene because area and energy has, do not have the same units. Okay. All right, so black holes satisfy the area law, the zero law, Kappa is constant on the equilibrium black hole. The area can only increase and they satisfy the first law. These are all analogies with uh, thermodynamics. As you know, uh, if you take, if you bring uh, quantum effects in and probably you have discussed this in the course with Ivan, um, um, then you can, you prove that actually black holes are thermal objects.
And uh, so the way you get convinced about that is Hawking's calculation of particle creation by a black hole, which is a beautiful calculation that has a lot of physical inputs in it. Because you actually prove that if you take a black hole form via gravitational collapse, which seems as a very complicated problem at first, because you say, I don't really know what are the details that led to the formation of the black hole. But it turns out that independently of the details of, of all these details, you can actually show that if you started here with a quantum state of some test field in the vacuum at scry minus, then if you look at for sufficiently late observers or people here for retarded time sufficiently large, then you can make an, an approximation that becomes better and better as you approach this point here, I plus. So for sufficiently late times when the black hole has settled down to a stationary black hole, then you see that the state of the quantum field looks like a thermal state with a definite temperature, which is Hawking temperature given by surface gravity kappa divided by two pi. And this is how the first law now turns into a thermodynamical relation delta M is equal to temperature times delta area over four plus omega delta J plus phi delta Q, where now this is really temperature. And so black holes have an entropy that is given by their area in four over four in Planck units. So if we put the units, that should be an L Planck square. Okay, so black holes are thermal objects. Um, if we put a vacuum here, particles are created due to the interaction between um, the quantum field, the test that taken as a test field moving on this space-time. And it's crucially important that this space-time is not translationally invariant. Moreover, it's very important that the past is very different from the future. So something breaks time translation invariance here, even though at the end of the day, the space-time becomes stationary, the future is very different from the past. In the past, we have weak fields and diluted matter. In the future, we have a black hole and event horizon and thermal effects. So if you look at the details of this calculation, you find that correlated to these outgoing particles that define the Hawking radiation, there are um, particles falling into the black hole, which are also outgoing, but they happen to be on the wrong side of the horizon, and therefore they hit the singularity. Okay, and so these, these particles are correlated, are maximally correlated between them. So which means that if I happen to detect one of these particles here at infinity, then I can be sure that there is a particle falling into the singularity with quantum numbers that are related to the quantum numbers of what I have detected at infinity. And this will play a role in what I will say in a moment. So, so I, I detect Hawking radiation at infinity, then Naively, you would expect, so this is sending energy back to infinity from the black hole. And so um, back reaction of this uh, radiation should produce the black hole to shrink. Okay, so this is a very difficult problem. It's a problem of semi-classical quantum gravity. I mean, of, of quantum gravity in general, but you can try to approximate it to an answer by looking at semi-classical stuff. And so one thing that we can say that is that, I mean, you can actually um, investigate the focusing properties of the of the quantum matter that is living on this background and what you find and so this is very very nice for instance you can compute rab ka kb which remember appeared in the fog in describing the focusing of the generators of the horizon via the right shadow equation so when you compute this via semi-classical Einstein's equations, which corresponds to writing Einstein's equations where you replace TAB by the expectation value of TAB in the quantum state, then this should be equal to the expectation value of TAB in this quantum state, Ka, Kb. And so you can show that this is actually negative at the horizon. 
So instead of having focusing, this matter, this quantum matter is producing anti-focusing. In, instead of, you know, making the, uh, so because of this anti-focusing effect, then you violate energy conditions, the energy conditions that went into the proof of the area law. And so delta A can be negative, area decreases. due to the back reaction of this quantum state. And this is something that is very hard and complicated to do. I mean, not very hard. I mean, it's kind of messy if you do it in four dimensions, but if you want to get an idea of this, just the physical idea in two dimensional models, this is extremely simple. And there is this beautiful book by Navarro Salas and, uh, and Alessandro Fabri that you can, where, where all these details are given. So in two dimensions, you can do this exactly and actually prove all these things exactly. In four dimensions, things are a bit more complicated because it's complicated to renormalize the energy momentum tensor. This has ultraviolet divergences and all this is a messy business in four dimensions and a trivial one or sort of simple one in two dimensions. So the area can decrease. And so the second law, the classical second law is now replaced by the statement of the generalized second law, namely the change in the black hole entropy plus the change in the entropy of whatever is the rest of things that are around must increase. So, and this leads uh, in a very convincing manner, ma manner to the idea that black holes evaporate. So in fact, you see, black holes form this this is a classical picture where a black hole so forms from the collapse of diluted matter they have, there is diluted matter there is some entropy around i mean you could describe this statistically mechanically and uh, somehow this is time reversal uh, you're breaking i mean this process is irreversible entropy grows towards the future and so classically you form a black hole and then you find something that has a huge entropy you know, for macroscopic black holes, the, the amount of entropy that you get from this formula is huge in any uh, standards, if you compare this with standard systems. So uh, the process of black hole formation is a highly irreversible process. And you might say, that's fine, and I am attaining equilibrium, and that's uh, a state of maximum entropy. But you would be wrong, because you're not still in equilibrium. Classically, yes, but quantum mechanically, particles are starting to being radiated away and the black hole shrinks and entropy keeps growing. So we are halfway in our process of maximizing entropy. The black hole formation is just the beginning. It lasts for a very long time. We'll see that, you know, you know I mean, it's known black, black holes, microscopic black holes last for very, very long time because the, this, rate, this temperature is very low for microscopic black holes. But we are only in a quasi equilibrium state. Black hole entropy, I mean, the entropy of the world keeps growing, keeps growing while the black hole evaporates. So the question is what is the nature of this eventual maximum entropy state of the universe that contains a black hole? And this is a question. Um, I mean, the precise description of that end result is something that does not have a completely clear answer at the moment and it has to do with the. Uh, so-called information loss paradox that I will evoke near the end of this lecture. All right, so, but before uh, going into trying to answer this question, let me quickly tell you how, I mean, one question that one would like to an answer also before is what is the statistical mechanical origin of this black hole entropy? And in loop quantum gravity, there is a tentative answer. So the black hole, the entropy of the black hole is given by, you know, there are microscopic states and entropy is computed, for example, in something like uh, a mic microcanonical ensemble. And so it turns out that in models of quantum gravity, in fact, what one counts is states, and there are reasons to count 
these states, which I don't have time to evoke now because I really want to get to the end of that, but uh, there is a lot of literature around the definition of black hole entropy, but there are reasons to uh, count states which have to do with surface states. So you have, uh, let me draw a picture that can be illustra illustrating. So this is the black hole horizon. And now uh, the area of this black hole horizon is induced by, I mean, there are quantum states in loop quantum gravity, which are given by the spin network states that puncture this surface. And uh, as you know, from the course of Maite, you know that the area of this two dimensional surface is, has, is, is uh, discrete and uh, these states are eigenstates of the area. So, you, so how, what is the origin of black hole entropy in these models or in, in this, from this perspective? So you count, it's just the log of n where n is the number, number of microstates you know, spin network states, quantum geometry states. Compatible with one constraint, then compatible with one given given um, microscopic horizon area. So you say, I am interested in a black hole of this area. So I fix this, this is my coarse graining. And I, so the assumption is that for a given classical geometry of the horizon, there is a multiplicity, a huge multi multiplicity of microstates and that the entropy comes from uh, this huge multiplicity, like in statistical mechanics. But this is a key point. The key point is that this implies that in loop quantum gravity, you think of classical geometry as emergent from the contribution of many, many, many fundamentally microscopic uh, states. And, and that, uh, that the number of degrees of freedom at, that, uh, at the fundamental level is much larger than the degrees of freedoms you might expect to have at the classical level. For instance, from the point of view of the Noher theorem, once you fix the area, the mass at the angular momentum of, an, of a black hole, then there is only one solution, okay? But so that would lead to, so there is one um, macroscopic point in your phase space with, and to that point, there are, in, there are many, many microscopic uh, degrees of freedoms that you count, and these are the responsible for the entropy of the black hole. So this point of view, once you take it, leads to um, a ca calculation of black hole entropy that is compatible with the uh, expectations. So there are some, there's some discussion about the immunity parameter and uh, et cetera, but I don't, I'm not gonna go into these things. Uh, um, whether matter plays a role or not, and whether the immunity parameter has to be fixed to some special value or not, et cetera, et cetera. So these are, these are some open issues in the discussion of black hole entropy. But the key point is that, and I'm gonna write it, one classical space-time geometry emerges or from the contributions of many microscopic quantum geometries. And, and that is something you see even in simple modes like uh, in quantum cosmology. You know, the Hilbert space of, of Wheeler de Witt quantum cosmology is much, much smaller than the Hilbert space of loop quantum cosmology. In particular, the Hilbert space of loop quantum cosmology is a non-separable Hilbert space. The Hilbert space of loop quantum gravity, it is also a huge non-separable Hilbert space. So the quantization uh, 
techniques that allow us to implement background independence lead us naturally to something that has a huge amount of new degrees of freedom. And we expect to recover the classical theory only by coarse graining of these many, many fundamental degrees of freedoms. And it is these many, many microscopic degrees of freedoms which are behind the notion of entropy in applications to calculations of entropy of a black hole. But this conclusion is more general than just uh, the uh, context of uh, black hole entropy calculation. So now we get to the end of, uh, of the lecture. How much time do I have, uh, Johannes, to see how? You're still good in time, so we have half an hour left. Okay, so. Okay, so the first statement of the paradox came with the idea that black holes evaporate. And so Hawking drew a picture like this. It's not clear why he drew a picture like that. It seemed naturally natural to him, I suppose. But this picture is probably responsible for a lot, a lot of, in my opinion, confusion that has lasted for, for about almost 50 years. So if the black hole evaporates, then the horizon should shrink until it disappears somewhere like this. And then after the black hole has completely evaporated, if you really trust the Hawking effect all the way until complete annihilation of the black hole, then you end up with space time, which is basically essentially flat here. We'll talk about that in more details in a moment. And, but the prejudice in, in this picture is to think of the singularity as the boundary of the space time, which is, which is a very, which was the way in which singularities were thought when singularity theorems were pro proven, right? In the, at the classical level, that's a very natural way to think about singularities. But here we're talking about quantum gravity. And this is why this picture is a bit, might be misleading. I mean, at least it's not obvious that this should be like that. And so the problem of information is that, I mean, it seems like fundamental theories are always unitary. And so if you know the past, you can predict the future. But when you have a black hole around that evaporates, it looks like uh, unitarity is in question. I mean, certainly if you drew, draw a picture like that, it looks like it because, you know, this, the, there seem hard to have a unitary evolution when already, if, if you interpret this picture classically, you know, this sigma is actually Cauchy surface of the whole of space time, but sigma prime or sigma one and sigma two here, certainly not. So if you give initial data in sigma two, you cannot predict the past. So there is certainly a problem if you draw the picture like that. And so Hawking tried to make sense of quantum theory in spite of breaking unitarity. And he made some, some statements about that and started in this way, the whole discussion. Now in, in the community of loop quantum gravity, people think rather that this picture is not the most appropriate one and that perhaps uh, that it should be replaced. And this comes from experience with simple models in cosmology, for example, where, where singularities is not the end of it. It's not a frontier in space time, but rather something in which you have quantum effects and then there is dynamical evolution across the singularity. The singularity is replaced by uh, a very quantum region. And on the other side, you might have something that looks classical again. So the picture that uh, was drawn first by, uh, I think first by Abai and, um, and Martin uh, in the, the beginning of the 2000s, looks more like this. So you have your black hole horizon and there is a region, which is this shaded region here where quantum effects are supposed to be very important. And then on the other side, space time is supposed to emerge classical, become classical again, according to our experience from quantum cosmology. And now it looks like we have good chances to understand quantum evolution in terms of unitary process. At least, naively speaking, these two Cauchy surfaces now uh, look like Cauchy surfaces. I mean, that, I mean, you can give data and reproduce uh, the whole of the space time from data on, on those. 
But this is only a naive uh, first expectation because as soon as you try, I mean, to, to test, you know, whether, I mean, I mean, this, <clears throat> this picture still leads to difficulties. I mean, it leads to difficulties if you believe that information, that this unitary, unitary evolution can be well approximated by the dynamics of some quantum field living on this uh, geometry, which is sort of semi-classical everywhere except for this little gray region here. And I will tell you about these difficulties. And this is the this is one of the key uh, messages of, of my of my lecture. I suppose. I suppose. I hope I can finish this. So, but first, let me tell you that the black hole region can still be defined in a very simple way. So, what is a black hole? First of all, now black holes evaporate. What is it that a black hole? is now. So one very simple proposal of what a black hole is, is to do just the usual definition, but, in, but replace the past of scry mind class by what I call here the classical past or the semi-classical classical past of J plus. What do I mean by that? So the semi-classical past of scry plus, sorry, is defined by uh, all the collection of points in your space time that can be connected to scribe plus by time like curves that will never go through a region of where quantum gravity effects are important. In this sense, the classical pass will be here, all this, and the black hole region is then this one here. Because if you are here, you cannot go out to infinity without crossing the high uh, curvature quantum gravity region, the shaded region, the would be singularity. Okay, so people have tried to argue that because now sigma one and sigma two are Cauchy surfaces, then there are good chances to understand, uh, you know to resolve the apparent paradox or tension with unitarity. And so let me tell you about some difficulties associated to that. If you wanna think of this as uh, a, a process that is described by some quantum field leaving on this, on this, uh, on this background, that's not enough and it, it, it doesn't work for the reasons for, I mean, it doesn't, it leads to difficulties. So let me tell you why. So, these are difficulties for information info, I'm going to write for QFT type of degrees of freedom. So if you want to pur purify Hockey radiation with quantum field theory degrees of freedom, then things become complicated. Let me tell you what I mean by purification. So let me draw the picture again. So we have our Penrose diagram. That is this quantum gravity region. That is the black hole horizon. And this is the point where uh, the black hole completely evaporates. So if I look at, <clears throat> At the bond the mass at infinity, then let me assume we start from a black hole that forms. Uh, I'm don't, I don't want to put too much stuff in the picture, but yeah, forms from the collapse of a, of a star. So the bond the mass if we put a bond the mass axis here starts large and then the black hole evaporates and it becomes zero or very close to zero. Let's say at this end point, we don't know what happens because when the black hole is very small, then quantum gravity effects become important and perhaps the calculation of Hawking is not really something we can trust. So let's say we end at something of a mass which is of the order of the Planck mass. Now here we have all the quanta produced by the Hawking radiation and this radiation is what makes the bonding mass go down because uh, radiation energy has been thrown to infinity. But remember that correlated with all this quanta, there are quanta of particles falling into the singularity. And so the question is, 
the question of purification is the following. So if these guys fall into the singularity and they evolve across the singularity because singularity is not the singularity in the fundamental theory, then these degrees of freedom should emerge here. And the correlations between the yellow and the white degrees of freedom will make the full state at the future a pure state if we started from a pure state in the past, which is what I am assuming, like the vacuum, for example. Okay, so we have to find the correlations between we have to find these degrees of freedoms that correlate with the white ones here so that the final state is pure. And therefore we can claim that we have a unitary evolution from something that was a pure state, the vacuum, to something in the future that has to be a pure state, the, the unitary evolution the, uh, of the vacuum. This will contain radiation that looks thermal here, but it will have to contain something else. If we think that this something else is encoded in the in quantum field theory, degrees of freedoms, then the first difficulty is that we have a lot of degrees of freedoms to purify the Hawking radiation that lasted for a long time, but very little energy available because the Bondi mass has dropped to the Planck mass or about the Planck mass. So these degrees of freedoms have to be very, very, very light. And uh, let me show you, and this implies that the time during which this purification happens is extremely long. So evaporation goes like m to the third, uh, purification will go like m to the fourth, which means that at the end of the evaporation, they have a little remnant with a lot, a lot, a lot of information inside. And this can lead to some difficulties in effective field theories. Difficulties that I'm not sure are really serious difficulties, but we'll see. But I mean, what I consider difficult is to, to, to actually find this very soft degrees of freedom coming out of the singularity as I will explain uh, a bit later. So let's say the energy left, so the rest of energy at the end of evaporation is about the Planck mass. The number of degrees of freedom that I need, the white, the yellow ones, is has to be bigger from, from the second law consideration. They have to be bigger than the initial number of degrees of freedoms which go like the uh, black hole entropy, sorry, and Planck square, right, which is about the black hole entropy. So I put a greater than equal because it would be equal if the process would be exactly reversible, but I mean, we know things will probably be irreversible and therefore the number of degrees of freedoms is greater than that. Now that means that each of these particles, let me call them gamma, these are like photons if you want, each of these particles will have to have extremely small energy, basically m Planck divided by the number of degrees of freedom that I need to, for purification. And so this gives you an energy which is less or equal than the mass Planck times the mass Planck square over the mass of the original black hole square. And this number is extremely small. It's 10 to the minus 76 um, if, uh, if we take a solar mass black hole. And now from, uncertain, from the uncertainty principle, we find that the time to emit one of these particles has to satisfy this equation. And from that, you find that the total time for evaporation, which has to be n times And the number of degrees of freedom times the time that, that, that does this goes like m over m Planck to the fourth. And I'm going very quickly, but it follows from this uh, uh, from, from this uh, series of, sorry. If this is delta gamma, so for a single foot, for a single particle, delta T gamma would be, would be, something that goes like m square over m Planck square time, times Planck, but the total time is n number of degrees of freedom times delta t gamma. And this is what goes like m over m Planck to the fourth times t Planck. And this is a huge time, much larger than the time of evaporation, which is already uh, huge in terms of uh, cosmological times. So these particles have to be extremely soft. Okay. So now because of the softness of these particles, we can construct uh, a no-go theorem. Oh, 
of the theorem, I would say no go argument, sorry. So theorem in quotation marks means an argument against axially symmetric backgrounds, which includes spherically symmetric backgrounds. Uh, so there has to be, there has been a lot of progress in modeling, you know, the, remo the removal of singularities in spherically symmetric models. And this is very nice and it's, it's, it's a very important progress in all this. The point I want to make is that one cannot use such background space times to be able to try to uh, understand, uh, to say anything useful about the problem of information. This is very useful to get some picture of how singularities might be removed. But as I will argue now, it cannot be helpful for understanding the problem of information. And the reason is that if we have axis symmetry, then angular momentum is conserved. So let me draw the picture again. So if this space time, background space time, is axis symmetric or spherically symmetric, then, then let me consider just uh, one pair of these particles. This is a Hawking particle and the one, the correlated particle here. So let me call this particle one, this is particle two, the two are correlated. And so let me assume that this particle has angular momentum L. So imagine you have a detector ascribed plus and you detect the particle with angular momentum L. Then because these two particles come from, from the vacuum state here, which is spherically symmetric, which is rotational invariant, then the particle two has to have momentum minus L if the space time is spherically symmetric and angular momentum is conserved. Because of course, if angular momentum is, conser is not conserved, the only thing I know is that the two particles have the same angular momentum here, but if the space time is not spherically symmetric or axially symmetric, angular momentum is not, need not be conserved like energy, right? These two particles can have correlated energies here, but we know that the particle that comes out because the space time is highly non-stationary, right? We have the black hole that form and evaporated. It's highly time asymmetric energy after can be different and therefore can be very, this particle can be very soft. But if we are in a spherically symmetric background, the angular momentum cannot change. If we are in an axis symmetric background. And this will lead to a paradox. So let's consider the first situation. The situation corresponds to situation one here. I am an observer when the black hole has formed before it has evaporated. So situation one, the black hole is microscopic. It has a radius of the order of its mass and it's emitting particle gamma one, particle one, okay? So black hole, is macroscopic. Now, because I detect this particle at infinity, and so I, I see where this particle comes from, and I will have the impression that the particle comes from around the black hole. In fact, there are precise calculations that show that this particle comes from a region which is about r equal to 3m. That's not important. It's important that this is a region of the order of m, which means that um, the impact parameter for the first photon will be of the order of the mass of the black hole. I will see this particle coming from somewhere around the region uh, around the black hole. Imagine the black hole as a black star, it's sending you a particle from about its surface. So the impact parameter for gamma one will be about M. The energy of that, photo, of that particle will be about KT, right? The temperature, the Hawking temperature at the moment. And the Hawking temperature is basically given by the Planck mass square divided by the mass for a Schwarzschild black hole, for a spherically symmetric black hole. So the temperature goes like one over M. Now remember in one of the first lectures, we derive a relationship between impact parameter and energy. B divided by E was equal to, sorry, not that. 
the impact parameter B is given by the angular momentum divided by the energy. So if I use that, then I see that the angular, the typical angular momentum that I would see for these particles will be basically given by B times E, B1 times E1. This gives me M Planck square, which is basically H bar square. So this is telling me that the typical Hawking particle I detect here will have an L, which is of the order of H bar. H bar, not H bar square, H bar, sorry. Okay, so good. So now let's analyze situation number two. So what we recall now is that L, well, it's already written there, that's very good. So let's go to situation number two. In situation number two, we have basically a remnant, which is of a radius of about the Planck size, right? In best situation, we, we, we yeah, of or the order of the Planck mass. And a particle, gamma two, correlated with gamma one is being emitted by this tiny Planckian remnant. So now we can estimate, now we know, it's, we know it's energy. We know that E2 has to be less than what we derived before, the mass Planck times um, <clears throat> the mass Planck divided by the or initial mass squared. It's an extremely tiny energy, right? Because that's all the energy that is available and we have to distribute it among a lot of degrees of freedom. And we know that the angular momentum has to be L, at least in absolute value, minus L, the sign is irrelevant. So we can compute what would be the impact parameter that we measure when we detect the other particle. And so we find that B2 would be given by, from our formula, the angular momentum, which is order of H bar divided by E2, and so what you find is that B2 is given, is greater or equal than L Planck, putting all this together, mass over M Planck square. So the particle will seem to be coming from a region, from a distance, which is a huge distance. If you put the numbers here, you get that B2 is, this number here is about 10 to the 15, size of the universe, times the mass over the solar mass. So for a solar mass black hole, you get 10 to the 15 times the size of the universe. So, which is totally inconsistent with the idea that there is a remnant emitting this particle, this soft particle uh, to you, you know, to purify the, uh, the, the original one. So in order to, for this idea to work, one really needs something that violates axis symmetry. We really need a model in which angular momentum is actually not concerned, conserved like energy, right? So we know that energy is not conserved here. The space-time diagram is highly time asymmetric. This is not a stationary thing. We have evaporation in place. Similarly, axis symmetry has to be um, we have to be very far from axis symmetry so that we avoid this paradox. So what is the possible resolution? I hope I have uh, five minutes left. You actually have almost 20 minutes left to the question. Ah, yeah. Okay, good. So I went too fast. <laughs> So what is the possible resolution is to take, of course, this is the obvious resolution to take into account back reaction. Of gamma two, the particle that falls into the singularity. But if we take back reaction into account, then another thing that we observed at the beginning of this lecture becomes important. Remember that near near the singularity.
the space time is very well for a, a Cauchy surface that goes close to the would be singularity here. We can approximate, I mean, in spherically symmetric models. In spherically symmetric models, the dynamics for a portion of this surface here is well approximated by uh, Kantowski Sachs uh, type of uh, situation, spherically symmetric uh, um, or a Schwarzschild interior um, situation, like the one we described at the beginning. Uh, in, of course, with the assumption of spherical symmetry. And in that situation, we, we observe that the cosmology is such that when we approach the singularity, we have an infinite stretching in this direction and an infinite contraction in this direction. So this is a highly anisotropic big crunch as we approach the singularity. And because of that, if we have a particle with non-trivial angular, angular momentum, which would mean some state which breaks uh, spherical symmetry, you know, some test, you know, I'm talking about the, par the particle we were discussing before, gamma two, is given by some something that breaks spherical symmetry because of this infinite contraction in the transversal direction. The frequency, which is a measure of you know, the frequency measure by a freely falling observer, which is a, the, a very nice observer falling into the singularity, blows up as we approach the singularity if the angular momentum is different from zero. So angular momentum again plays an important role. There is a piece that is infinitely redshifted. This is the part that has to do with the conserved quantity E. And this has to do with this infinite stretching in this direction. But we have the infinite contraction that due to angular momentum conservation leads to, you know, uh, this uh, kinetic energy in the transversal direction to blow up plus corrections here. Now, this is something we concluded by just simply looking at the motion of test particles, but it is also the same conclusion holds and not surprisingly, because it's geometric, it has to do with this geometry here. If you look at solutions of the Klein-Gordon equation or the Maxwell's equation for fields, you know, test fields, of course. So you see that uh, effects become quickly Planckian as you approach the singularity. And so if you were going to take into account the back reaction, this will completely, this will break the spherical symmetry of your initial assumption. So you cannot describe this back reaction properly. And you need to do that if you are going to tell me how is it that this degree of freedom emerges on the other side to purify the original Hawking quanta. You cannot simply not do that with a spherically symmetric background. One has to go away from spherical symmetry. One has to take into account deviation from spherical symmetry that happen at the Planck scale. And this is where uh, I will, this is where the whole argument takes us to this idea of the microscopic degrees of freedom. So, and the irreversibility of this whole process. Remember, you form a black hole, it becomes entropy grows. You seem to have achieved the final state, the stationary state by maximiz ma maximizing entropy, but this is only a quasi stationary state. You have a black hole that is stationary with a huge entropy. And now you start emitting Hawking quanta and the black hole evaporates. This process must be increasing entropy. Again, entropy has not stopped increasing all the time. And now we're seeing that everything that is falling into the black hole hits the Planckian regime. So the wavelength of these photons becomes Planckian. And if you take into account back reaction, you have to use quantum gravity, full quantum gravity, the fundamental theory without symmetry assumptions. And there you're interacting with the microscopic degrees of freedoms. Those degrees of freedoms that are huge in numbers. Those are the degrees of freedoms that are responsible for the entropy of the black hole. But from the point of irreversibility, once you hit 
these underlying degrees of freedoms that were sort of not attainable before. So at low energies, you cannot touch these degrees of freedoms, but here at the singularity, these particles are falling and their energies become Planckian. You're interacting with this Planckian uh, huge amount of new degrees of freedom. And so what you expect is that according to the second law of thermodynamics, your entropy will hugely grow and that the answer to the question of information will reside into these degrees of freedoms more than on low energy QFT type of degrees of freedom. And so this whole argumentation leads to a picture that we have that explore in a series of papers about the possible resolution in which, and this is what, uh, unfortunately, I'm not gonna give you many details uh, because we are near the end and I am kind of, yeah. Alex, there is a question. Yeah. Um, so let me read it to you. It's um, since evaporation is due to back reaction of matter fields falling into the black hole, doesn't seem unnatural to expect that even conceding that there is something to the future of the singularity, that this region should be described by classical geometry. Doesn't it yeah. seem more natural that after the singularity entangle entanglement between quantum gravity states and field states would make it hard to simply describe this region as fields over a classical background? Yeah, that's exactly the point of my last slide. So you just have to answer, you have to just describe my personal viewpoint about the information paradox. Namely, this, so there are a few pictures I can draw, but that's the point. The point is that you don't expect to recover any unit. I mean, that this picture has many, many limitations. In particular, here in the future, you expect to, the, to be uh, correlations between the Hawking particles and defects at the Planckian structure, which cannot be described in any effective field theory. So the correlations are correlations between your Hawking quanta and defects at the Planck structure. Just like when you burn a book, the information in the book is not destroyed. Nobody would just uh, nobody would say that in unitarity is being, uh, you know, at, at stake. In when you burn the book, you know that at the end, inform you you believe we believe believe because we believe of the fundamental unitarity of fundamental physics that the information in the book remains in the correlations between these molecules that uh, go into the atmosphere and uh, you know the ashes and the products of the com combustion. So the information goes from the macroscopic letters in the book to microscopic correlations in the microstates of matter. Here, similarly, the correlations between Hawking particles outside and inside are trans this one transfers their correlations to defects at the Planck scale. And so information is just degraded. Entropy grows. This is very, very time asymmetric. And the future is very different. So space time in the future that is described by this approximately Minkowskian space time is just, just not a very good picture anymore. So in fact, there are quantum differences between tiny differences between the quantum geometry and, and the state of matter and geometry in the future. So maybe a more appropriate picture would be something like that. Let me see if I can draw it. Uh, so sometimes we I drawn this picture. So here to the future, we have, this is just a picture, okay? A quantum superposition of many things that from the point of view of a low energy observer will look like Minkowski space-time. Why? Because because we do believe that the bonding mass is gone very close to zero or to a very tiny amount of the order of the Planck mass here. So the space time here is basically, we get the superposition of quantum states, all of which in some sense are very close to Minkowski space time, but we have a superposition and it is in the correlations between the Hawking particles and this uh, microscopic differences between all these Minkowski space times that uh, purification is to be, is to take place. And of course, such a thing cannot be described in an effective quantum field theory. They are the fundamental mi uh, microscopic degrees of freedoms of quantum gravity that should be invoked. If you describe things in terms of an effective field theory, then you would be like in the position of burning the book, 
information will seem to be destroyed. So evolution will seem to be not unitary, but just because you are forgetting some degrees of freedom. And so it's hard to do this precisely because uh, our control of quantum gravity is very, very far from, free, from, from, from clear uh, in, in the full non spherically symmetric situation. But with uh, Lautaro Amadei, we have a very simple and nice model in our view of quantum cosmology. As I said, the Hilbert space of quantum cosmology has the same feature. It's huge, it's non-separable. It's much larger than the Hilbert space of Willard DeWitt equation. There are all these hidden degrees of fields in quantum cosmology as well. And what we show is that if we start from, so this is the would-be singularity. We start from some pure state. If you just ignore some of these microscopic degrees of freedom, so you define a density matrix, which is initially pure, but a reduced density matrix that you define by tracing over this, some microscopic degrees of freedoms that you define as unobservable, which are very naturally there, uh, unobservable from the point of view of uh, low energy physics. There's then you show that the time evolution of that uh, when you, because you're tracing over relevant microscopic degrees of freedoms is not going to be unitary in spite of the fact that the evolution of the in the fundamental theory is perfectly unitary. So in quantum cosmology, we can make this idea completely precise. And there are a few papers in, uh, out there where we describe this. In general, for a moment, we can only argue that this is the natural resolution of the uh, information paradox. You sit and up 10 minutes go. until the questions. I, I would stop there. I, I think uh, we can start having questions. I think that that was what I was planning to to say. Maybe I say everything too fast. Uh, so maybe we can extend the the question time, if you. Okay. If you like. Then uh, please raise your hands and or, or write in the chat for for questions. Actually, I, I got another question to to the beginning of the lecture, and it was about the um, the entropy growth of the black hole or the total entropy. Mm -hmm. Um, it was about um, your argument how you come from um, basically the, the area of the black hole is always increasing. How you did you get from this to um, the generalized second law that the, also the okay so the uh, entropy is also increasing. Right, the entropy is always increasing classically, and uh, and uh, the area law holds as long as. I'm trying to find the place where things here. The area law holds as long as energy conditions hold, right? The, the, we need this to be positive for the area theorem to hold, which is the case for matter satisfying the strong and or weak energy conditions and Einstein's equations. Now, as I said, uh, particle creation near a black hole violates this condition. This can become negative, and so the area can decrease. Okay. Now, one expects, be, due to the analogy with thermodynamics, that this will hold. And there are several examples of special situations where this can be checked. There are some proofs of the sec generalized second law. Okay. But these proofs always rely on a special definition of what you mean by entropy of the rest. So usually you use entanglement, some definitions of entanglement entropy. Uh, so let's say that this is something you expect to hold. There are some proofs, but uh, it, having a completely general proof is not so easy because it, because it might, because you need to know a lot of, about matter. Okay. So under, with some assumptions, uh, uh, you can prove this, but it's something that physically you expect to hold. And examples, there are many examples that suggest that this holds. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Um, if not, you can, I mean, the person who asked the question can ask again. Uh, okay, I just now got, got a, a message. <laughs> it, it is fine now. Um, there's another question. Um, it's is the last picture relating to Hawking's thunderbolt singularity in black hole ev evaporation. Uh, is the last picture related to what? 
uh, Hawking's Thunderbolt singularity in black hole evaporation? Uh, I'm not sure. Now, like that, I don't know. Uh, so maybe I can make more comments if this person develops a bit more about that picture. What is it? Uh, yeah. I don't know what to say. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Because, well, okay. So maybe some extra comment can help me okay. answering more precisely. Yeah, so there is no comment so far. Um, there's another question. It's um, about also the, the previous derivation. It's um, to prove the first law, you used the, the presence of the uh, bifurcation point. But we saw that in the case of a real black hole resulting from, a, from the collapse of matter, this bifurcation point does not exist. So how to adapt this proof in the case of a real black hole? Mm. I think I tried to argue that it, we were doing that the proof was correct, uh, but maybe it wasn't clear. So the idea is that this is the physically relevant situation. And uh, there is the physical input, this physical assumption that if you just cut a piece of this space-time diagram, this will be to a very good approximation isomorphic to um, to a piece of the bifurcating horizon space-time. In fact, there is a paper by Wall in which they try to argue this the, precisely. Okay, so that's the point that, that that it's a very good point. It's a very good question. But so I didn't give any further. I mean, there is a whole paper if you want to read more details. But the basic idea is that if you take so that you can extend. Something like that. You can let me cut on along this uh, this uh, yellow line here, and so use the geometry in this region, and now evolve backwards in time. And so, to a very good approximation, you should be able to reconstruct a bifurcating. I mean, the space time that contains the bifurcating horizon is in this region is very very close to the real space time where you formed the black hole by gravitational collapse and you waited long enough. So this, this yellow, maybe, maybe it didn't, maybe one has to draw this yellow region in a, with more, a little bit more care and consider, you know, a region which is sufficiently late where the space time is sufficiently close to a stationary space time. A stationary space time is according to the Noher theorem given by the Kerr solution. And so a Kerr solution, if you have a piece of a Kerr solution, you can extend it backwards in time to get the bifurcating uh, surface. So it's, it's a physical argument, it's not a theorem, okay? It's a physical idea that tells you that this, that's why this is called the physical process proof. Nobody has ever claimed that this is like a theorem. And there are other aspects which uh, you may raise one of them is, yeah, but I don't want to go into this because uh, I mean, I don't want to go into the difficulties if you don't ask me for the difficulties. <laughs> but if you, if you think about, if you consider this proof a uh, long time, you see that there are other weaknesses, but this proof is taking as a physical argument more than as a theorem, okay? The other weakness uh, uh, of this is the assumption that theta and infinity is zero. Of course, this is a very natural physical assumption. If I tell you, okay, the space time settles down to something uh, stationary and therefore theta must be zero at the end. But in linearized gravity, this is something that will never happen. And we are using only linearized gravity. So you're putting some physical input there too. But this is very nice proof. I mean, there are theorems. There, there are some proofs that use also the structure of a bifurcating horizon, which are really theorems, papers by Wall, by Abai, but they are very abstract. Like you use, right, you use like the structure of, of uh, covariant phase space and, uh, and, you, and you end up getting a, a, a first law, but that relates point in phase space. And so it's very hard to connect these proofs, which are theorems, to a physical process in which you actually throw something into a black hole and see what happens. So you gain in rigorousness, but you lose in understanding, in my opinion. So that's why I like this, this one, right? I mean, theorems are great. Mathematical physics is very, very important. 
But for quantum gravity, which is a theory under construction, sometimes physical intuition is more important in my opinion, right? We need, we don't know what the right mathematics is. We have some hints about the mathematics. We have made a lot of progress, but what we need is to construct a full theory. And we are not sure if all these mathematical ingredients are, are, are correct or whether we have to add some other things. And so physical ins hints insight is crucial in my opinion. Then we can make everything rigorous, but uh, what we need is to understand the physics well to be able to make little steps uh, forward. Okay, thank you. Um, there's there's another question. Um, there's a raised hand. I asked to unmute. Now it should work. Uh, okay. Hello. Uh, this hi. is Musin. Uh, hi. Uh, this is Musin, actually. Uh, so <laughs> I'm using my student account. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's uh, um, yeah. The question about Thunderbolt uh, singularity. So, so because there was a ah. old paper by Hawking in yes. in in '92. Uh, so, what what the argument um, was that the the singularity he he, he discovered what a proposal of uh, of singularity for the uh, well, yeah, renewed I... sing a different kind of singularity for black hole evaporation is is uh, yeah it's precisely this, this kind of uh, singularity there is, there is a singularity called, here. Uh, yes yeah. and and uh, yeah at that time he he called it a thunderbolt singularity it's kind of naked singularity uh, the argument is it's i think a little bit also similar as as you did and um, he discovered some kind of energy blows up near near this uh, region and so then he, he claimed that um the there is uh, this kind of uh, singularity like you draw the the yellow curved line here and and then or when i think i could also understood this this singularity like the domain wall separating uh, classical space time and quantum space time exactly looks like uh, what you described here i see so okay. that's why i thought i thought maybe there's some okay singularity. No, no, now it comes to my mind. I, I do remember, but that's why I didn't. So you were the one asking the question at first. That's right. That's right. I use okay. my student. Okay. okay. So uh, uh, yes, could be related. I, I have seen this paper. I have to look at it again. Uh, in my mind, there does not need to be anything singular in the sense of, uh, you know, curvature blowing up and quantum effects around this region here, okay? Uh, along this null uh, surface. And this is where, but I'm, yeah, I, I, I don't see this as a necessity from this general discussion. But if, uh, if we say that, uh, you know, f uh, reality is very quantum to the future of the would-be singularity here, and what separates the sort of classical region where, uh, where space-time is semi-classical from something that is a superposition of very quantum stuff, we call this a singularity. Could be, could be that this, I mean, if this is what he means by the, that singularity, then it could, there could be some, some relationship. But I think he, he's talking about some divergence of the energy flow here, right? Some, that's some, right, yes, that's right. That's right. Uh, yeah. I, 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 I'm going to check again and, 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 and I will let you know. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, and I have another um, comment. Uh, maybe you uh, uh, want Yet. to know your opinion. So, so there is some recent new progress um, from, from uh, ADSFT, ADSFT side um, regarding the remnant uh, of black hole. So um, the proposal is is that actually um, those moles which which uh, in falling inside black hole actually um, um, they are not not really uh, linear independent, yeah, and the the proposal is that actually the, the Hubble space inside uh, the remnant of the black hole is not like uh, all those moles are linear independent and they they maybe only span a very small uh, Hubble space. Very maybe even one dimension of Hubble space, and those linear, the, those moles in falling uh, Hawking particle inside black hole, um, because of the back reaction, whatever reason, 
they they uh, they, they they become linear dependent. Yeah, and and that that was the proposal um, they they raised. And so, what is your uh, comment on that? I don't know. I mean, all this is motivated by holography, right? So the idea that the it number... was um, it was um, yeah, it was uh, yes, it's so JT gravity. Um, and the, the idea that the, the average, the idea that I'm from the average, but there is the idea that the uh, Hilbert space of in the inside of the black hole is finite dimensional. That's uh, right. And bounded or, or described by the area of the black hole. And uh, yes, yeah, okay. So I have this orthogonal viewpoint, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, from loop quantum gravity. At least it seems to me uh, things are very not holographic, and I don't see any reason to have such holography. And well, so but, that, but, that's uh, my prejudice against this. Uh, yes, yes. Um, so uh, I, I am biased to, to. I mean, one one takes different viewpoints, right, and explores how far one can go. I, I don't. I don't share the view that uh, black hole has to be described by a finite dimensional. Hilbert space. I don't even, I don't see any motivation for that. Before ADS CFT, this was taking this was reason to you know like the to a principle, right? The holographic principle. I never understood what are the motivations for that to be taken as a principle. I, I think all of the apparent paradoxes that lead to this this. Uh, thing can be described without assuming holography, but that's my personal view. So you, that you know, you know, I think. I see. Okay. But, but, uh, um, well, the, my, my, um, my point of view is, is, um, well, the, the, the thing which is, um, seems to be interesting to me is, is that I'm the, the, uh, the claim that the proposal that um, the, the, uh, Hawking particle, they are not really May they may not be uh, linear yeah. independent holes. Yeah. Uh, so right. What do you think about that? I think that's a possibility, right? I mean, first of all, all these pictures I am drawing, and I use the intuition of uh, quantum fields, which are test fields, living on this background, and we know that at the fundamental level, what we need to compute is physical states, which are solutions of the Hamiltonian constraint, which and sort of are constructed out of relations between the matter degrees of freedoms and the geometry. And so all this is all these pictures where I have linear things where I can superimpose and I always have the same space time are all questionable. And uh, so, yeah, there could be something like that going on. But for that, we need to study things from the full theory point of view. I think it's hard at the, at the moment. Um, I'm not sure if in this quantum cosmology toy models one can do something that would be that would be nice, but uh, at the moment I don't know. Okay, I see. Thank you. Okay, there are three more minutes left for questions. Um, so we yeah. know there's nothing, but uh, let's wait a moment more. Maybe some questions still emerge. <laughs> Yeah, it does not seem to be the case. Um, okay, um, in that case, I think we can thank you, Alex, and um, go to the break. Okay, I hope this has been useful. Thank you, everybody, for attending the lecture.